know, my name is Brian Pardo, and I'm here to talk to you about teaching machines to listen. And <clears throat> I want to say that as a musician and a technologist, um, sometimes people talk to me as if our culture and our technology are, are two opposite things, like you can't be a musician and a computer scientist. And I just want to point out that our technology is our culture, and our culture is our technology, and it's been that way for a very long time. What you're listening to right now was the sound of a 30,000-year-old mammoth ivory flute. For at least 30,000 years, our technology and our culture have been intertwined. And for over 100 years now, our, our technology, our recording technology has become really intertwined with our, our musical culture. So next. Hello. All right, and as we've used recording technology in our music, we've become more and more um, able to manipulate sounds in all sorts of amazing ways. But as we've been doing it, it's become harder and harder to actually use the technology. And of course, this issue isn't limited to just music. It's if you've ever tried to use Photoshop or, say, Skype a lecture from uh, London to the University of Chicago, you know that there's all sorts of headaches and hiccups with dealing with this stuff. Um, so let me play for you a recording that we did in the early 2000s. Next. Okay, now that was recorded in the 2000s, but it was designed to be in sort of an older style, and we wanted it to sound tinny like an old-time radio. So we wanted it to sound more like this. Next. Instead of... All right, because I'm a high-tech guy and I seek high-tech solutions, I decided to go to the standard high-tech solution that we all use these days, which is an audio production software suite, which can definitely make the sound tinnier. Next. Okay. This is Pro Tools. And on the screen, a very full screen full of all sorts of controls and knobs and sliders, there is, in fact, a tool that can make it sound tinny. Can you figure out which one it is? I'll make it easier for you. Next. It's the parametric equalizer. Next. So right now you should be looking at a great big picture of a parametric equalizer which has 21 knobs on it. And one thing I want you to notice is that there's nothing labeled the tinny knob. So the problem here is, in fact, deeper than that, I don't know what any of these knobs do. It's not intuitively obvious what the HPF, or the LPF knob actually do. So we don't have what they call clear affordances, a clear mapping between a knob and what you expect to come out when you change that knob. And we have a lot of controls here, and it's very difficult. So we have a problem, and one way we can solve it is by me spending six months learning an audio production suite, but there's another way to do things. Next. Instead of me learning what the software means by parametric equalization, how about if the software learns what I mean by tinny? So we decided to flip the paradigm, have the software learn the meanings of sound adjectives and build us new interfaces automatically that would let us use tools in the terms that we want to think instead of having to change our thinking to fit the tool. Next. The way we do this is simple. We actually teach it. And how do we teach it? Well, you give it a word, some sort of adjective to describe sound, and then it changes sounds and asks you, well, how much does this conform to our So here's an example. Here's an original sound. Okay. 
and then we manipulate it next. And we ask you to rate that. How tinny is that? We do it again. And as we do this, every time you rate another example, the machine learns more about what tinny means to you, and eventually it can build an equalization curve that captures it. Next. And what you see here is the EQ curve that our tool, socialeq.org, learned from me when I taught it tinny. And for those of you who don't know what an EQ curve is, the horizontal dimension this way is the dimension that captures whether it's a high frequency or low frequency. High frequencies are to the right, lows are to the left. And then if you see the line go up, that means we boosted that frequency. And if it's lower, it means we lowered that, the amount, the, the volume of sound at that frequency. OK, so at this point, over a 1,000 people have taught the system. And uh, let me show you some words that two different people taught it next. Right now, you should be looking at a slide with two listeners, and they've each taught it the same three words, and the resulting equalization curves, the amount that we boost or cut different frequencies, is shown for each listener in each word. And one thing I want you to notice is a lot of times people do share a meaning. So if you look at the dark column, both of those curves look pretty similar. If you look at the tinny column, in fact, listener two has a very different idea about what tinny means than listener one. And if anything, listener two's bright looks more like listener one's tinny. So some words have more broad agreement and other words, you know, people vary in what they mean. And what we've done is we've actually plotted and placed everyone's concepts for these sound adjectives into a space and we've moved the, them around depending on, on how similar they are. And you get something like this. Next slide. What you see here are the words muffled, tinny, bright, broad, and warm, all in a 2D space. And now the words are coded by color. And every time you see a muffled, that means one person taught the word muffled to the machine. And what you can see is that you've got these regions, like the blue tinny region or the sort of green muffled region, where maybe there's some overlap between words, but there's some shared meaning across people here. Muffled means kind of the same thing to a lot of people. And what we can do with that as we learn the, the meanings of these words to broad groups of people is we can actually go ahead and build an interface that's based on that. Next slide. What you should be seeing here is the interface to Tone Booster's EZQ. This is an equalizer that um, they actually, this is exciting as an academic. Somebody actually read my paper and then made a thing based on it. It is so rare. I've written so many papers and uh, I was pretty excited. Um, so this is actually commercially available by Tone Boosters. I, I have no share in the company. I don't make any money off of this. but. They made this, and as you can see, what you've got here in the middle is a dot that you drag around towards a word like dark or bright or tinny, and it changes the sound. And so I'm going to show you how we used it on the sound on the recording we played earlier. Next. Okay, now that interface is a lot easier to understand than the 20-some knobs on that parametric EQ you saw earlier. And if you had to guess at what you were supposed to do with it, you'd probably guess right. All you do is drag the dot towards the word that means the sound quality that you're looking for, and that's what you get. And in fact, that interface turned out to be so, so useful that people who are used to the parametric EQ interface have been adopting it as well. So next slide. There's a website called Gear Sluts, and this is not some kind of a dating site. This is a website where people who are really interested in audio tech, recording engineers, these kind of people go and talk about the uh, audio equipment that they're using. And these are some of the reviews of this. 
things like I tried it on the master bus on an already good mix and it made it clearer or punchier. So this interface, this idea of making the interface talk to you in the terms that we use instead of us having to relearn the meanings of all our words is, is sort of a really powerful concept and learning it automatically from people is, is I think the right way to go. And I'm not the only one that thinks that way and neither are tone boosters. Next. What if your hearing aids could be adjusted in terms of the words you use to describe sound? And, ear, and I don't have any shares in ear machine, have adopted this as well and are using it for a hearing aid to adjust the quality of your hearing aids on the iPhone. Okay, I know we've got not a lot of time, so I'm going to wrap up here and just say, okay, next slide. 30,000 years ago, we made tools that, that helped us make sounds. About 100 years ago, we made tools that helped us record sounds. And uh, we got all fancy with the technology starting you know, in, in the 20th century. That's a Roland 808 drum machine. And in the 21st century, we're starting to realize that the technology really needs to listen to us, understand how we think, and adapt its interfaces to the way we think about stuff, the way we talk about stuff, and that's what we're doing in my lab, and Social EQ is one example of that. Please give it a try. Go teach it a word. The more, the merrier. And I'll just wrap up by thanking the very important people who really made this work happen, and these are the graduate students who have worked with me on this project, Andy Sabin, Zafar Rafi, David Little, and Mark Cartwright, and I also better thank the National Science Foundation because they're the people that paid for all this. So thank you very much. I think that's about 12 minutes.